that we were sitting next to you, I think. Hey, um, go ahead and open up to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, we're going to start in verse 40. We've been talking about the ministry of Jesus and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And today I want to talk to you about how when you follow Jesus, you're, you're basically going to be following him into impossible situations. There's just no two ways about it. When you're following Jesus, you're going to find yourself in situations that are way above your pay grade. And as I said a couple of weeks ago, our job is to relax and let him do his work. So in just a minute, we're going to read this passage, and we're going to hear mostly about Jesus and the people that he's speaking to and ministering to. But I want you to imagine yourself as one of the disciples. The disciples, you know, I, I think they were highly excited but they were all and convicted but they were also confused at times they didn't know what was happening they didn't know what was going to happen and in one sense they're kind of along for the ride and and as i've been following jesus for many many years i've learned to constantly try and release control to the lord can you just sigh with me <sighs> you know when you have family situations when you have friends that are going through something when you meet a stranger and um, they're in, in, in a cir circumstance or situation, and, and there's, it, you don't, may not even have compassion in your own heart because you're tired, but you know that there is in the heart of the Lord. When, when an opportunity opens up for you to go and pray for someone who's sick or in the hospital or to pray from, from afar, to pray for someone who's had chronic unemployment, to pray for someone who's in depression, to pray for someone who's suicidal, all these who are in addictions, all these things are above our pay grade, amen? amen? But they're not above his. He's perfect, he's perfect in his goodness, and he's perfect in his timing. So the frustration comes is when you're a disciple who wants to tell the Lord what to do. Okay? Point at the person next to you and say, that's you. All right? You know? We, we try and tell the Lord what he is going to do and when he's going to do it. And if you're in that situation, you're going to find yourself frustrated. But if you follow him, you'll find yourself in places in front of people in situations that you never expected yourself to be in. And, and you're there for a purpose. And God will use you. So I'm not going to reference this, but many of you know this fantastic scripture that says, Christ in you, the hope of glory, right? And, and you are filled with the spirit of Jesus Christ. And so the, the hope is that at any moment, there can be fresh and new glory that you see, that you experience um, in him. And, and so I want to just encourage you, there's going to be a situation this week, if not this week, then there's going to be next week that you're going to have an opportunity to pray something outlandish to pray for something impossible, and go ahead and do it. And I hope that in this message you can be encouraged and understand that not only is God capable of answering every one of our requests and prayers, but he's perfect in the way he does it in the, and in the timing. Amen? So before we read the scripture, I just want to tell you that years ago there was this book that was incredibly popular among business people and pastors. Many of you have heard of it. How many of you have heard of the book, um, seven Habits of Highly Successful People. Have you heard about that one? It was almost impossible not to have read that book at one time if you were in the ministry. If you didn't have the book, someone was giving you the book, and then they'd ask you questions about it. And um, the idea is that if you could just master these seven habits, then you could be like a highly successful person, like Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and Donald Trump. You could be just like them. And um, as I, you know, and the problem for me was, is that the seven habits, were, that was like six too many for me, you know. Every time I'd remember two of them or three of them, I'd forget the other ones. And so seven was just a little bit too hard for me. But I also realized that I didn't want to be like the highly successful people. I came to a realization pretty early on that workaholics were not successful people. They were people who chose to succeed in one area of life to fail at every other area of life. And, and that I wanted to be like Jesus. I wanted to be mindful of God's presence and where he had put me at, at all times. And so I realized that Jesus' way of doing things was different than the seven habits of the highly successful people. In fact, if Jesus had habits, and he did, um, he seemed to have two main habits that everything else flowed from. And I'm not just talking about prayer. I've always been challenged that Jesus would get up very, very early in the morning and pray uh, for a long time. Uh, even if I get up early in the morning, I pray for a shorter time until after coffee. Just open confession to you, okay? But 
Jesus' habits were really focused on two principles. And the first one was loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And you know the second one. It's found in Matthew 22. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, it's really interesting. If you think about it, it's kind of like not even two commandments. It's kind of one commandment. It's love the Lord your God. And when you're around other people, love the Lord your God by loving other people. Okay? Many of you are trying to find something wonderful to love in someone who annoys you, and you're not going to be able to do that easily. (laughs) Or someone that just happenstance arriving. But if you realize how much he loves them and that you can love him by loving the person in front of you, then you're going to solve that riddle real quick. You know? It's really good. Yep, good job, Pastor. All right. So the, the challenge, though, and one of the reasons why we're resistant to love other people is because we kind of have enough trouble already. And we realize if we give our hearts to someone else, maybe some of their troubles will become our troubles. Come on, can you be honest with me? That's a concern. That's the challenge. But even though I might not always be up to the challenge and you might not be up to the challenge, God is up to the challenge and Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so again, this is not about us performing. This is about us being in his presence and realizing that his presence is always with us. And so the pressure is off you and I. We're to exist in his stability, not to try and control everything until it's stable to our liking. And so we we can go and and love people that we just met. Like my friend Sarah here, what a blessing. (laughs) You know, we can go and, and, and encounter people, and if they're going through something really difficult, guess what? Jesus is in control, and you're along for the ride. That should be what this message is called, so I blew it. I blew it. I messed up the title. But, you know, you are along for the ride. So go ahead and try that too. Say, you're, I'm along for the ride. Okay. So we're going to begin reading in verse 40 right now. And here's what it says. Now, when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jarius, a synagogue leader, came and fell at the feet of Jesus, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. So here's Jesus. What's his priorities? He's here to love God and to love others. And this man has approached him and said, come, rabbi, come, teacher, and pray for my daughter. Now, the interesting thing is, is that Jesus, when he was on earth, he did not go and visit every single sick bed. And he didn't disrupt every single funeral. But in this case, we know why he went. He was invited. He was invited. And that's something that I, uh, you know, want to practice in my life is to invite the Lord, hey, um, come into my issues, come into my problems, come into my great day, come into every celebration, Lord. But when someone else that I know has a a difficulty or even an impossible situation, I want to say, God, come into this. Come to my friend. He's on his sickbed. He's on his deathbed. Let's read further, verse 42. As Jesus was on the way, on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. So this is a lot of people. You know, if you go to other nations, right, Sarah? If you go to other nations, there's not the same amount of space as there is in the United States. And so I've been in countries, I remember I was in one uh, bus in the Philippines, and I was in this bus, and it was full. It was fuller than any bus could ever be. And the bus kept stopping and putting more people on it. (laughs) And so it was just like I thought we were 100%, 110% full, but nope, we would stop. More Filipinos would get on the bus, and then we would keep going. The crowds are crushing Jesus here. If you've ever been in one of those situations, you know how claustrophobic this situation really is. But the, there was a woman there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. Now, just to be clear, what it's talking about is a woman who's had a flow of menstrual blood for 12 years. All the ladies should go, oh, oh my. Just imagine that happening to you for 12 years. But no one could heal her. In Mark chapter 5, the same story is told, and it says that this woman had gone to many doctors. She'd spent a large amount of money trying to resolve this problem. And, they, and it had only gotten worse, only gotten worse. She came up behind him and touched the, 
the edge of his cloak. Now, this is a little bit significant because there's a prophecy in Malachi chapter 5 where it says that when the Messiah comes, he's going to have healing in his wings. So isn't it cool that the Messiah is going to have wings? But it doesn't mean angelic wings. What it is is the, the edges of the garments. How many of you have seen the Jewish garments with the tassels? They're called tzitzit, okay? It's kind of fun to say, tzitzit, okay? You know, but these tassels that come off the end, and the idea is that the Messiah is going to flow with so much of the grace of heaven that even the, the very edges of his garments are going to bring healing. So I don't know if this woman knew this passage, but I think she might have. I think she might have realized that even in the edge of his garments, there was healing. And she thought, this is the Messiah. This is the Messiah. Now, the other side of this is that in the Old Testament, when a woman was in her menstrual cycle, uh, she wasn't supposed to touch anyone else, and no one else was supposed to touch her. Uh, I think it's the Lord's way of saying, like, when the ladies are just in that situation, just bless them and, and leave them alone, back off a little bit. But, but the whole idea is that this is a law in the Old Testament that if, if you touched a woman who was in this condition or she touched you, you'd be ceremonially unclean. So what she's about to do next is, is controversial and probably one of the reasons why she thought more than once, should I do this? Okay, so she touched the edge of his cloak and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked. And when they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. In other words, he's saying, Jesus, why are you asking who touched you? Everybody's touching you, Lord. <laughs> Everybody is pressing around you. But Jesus said, someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. So I, I want you to understand this. He is, he is doing all of his miracles, not from his own power. He could have, but he's... He's existing as a real human being. He is 100% he is human, and it's the Holy Spirit that's filling him. Now, the Holy Spirit is not power, but the Holy Spirit has power. And so what he has learned is that the power of the Holy Spirit has flowed out of him, and he could feel it happening. And if you've ever experienced the Holy Spirit, and I hope all of you have and will often, there are often times when you are charged with power. So much so sometimes that you will, your body will actually react. And um, if, if you ask me, what do you think about when someone is prayed for and they fall over, I go, yep, it happens. It's a thing. It really does. And very often it can be life transforming when the Holy Spirit hits you like that. But Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. He felt power leave him. And he knew that someone had come up and, and activated their faith, basically. The woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. And in the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him. So just imagine how embarrassing that was and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Whew. So why didn't the Lord rebuke this woman for touching him when she was ceremonially unclean. Remember Jesus, when he, uh, you know, was, when he was understanding the law of Moses, he's the one who spoke the, the law to Moses. He's the one, he's the word. And so he's the one who gave this word to Moses. But I want you to just think for a little bit. There's a difference between being someone who is pursuing religious rigor and then someone who is following the principles of Jesus, okay, his highly successful principles. It's not that Jesus is discounting the law of Moses. For one reason, he didn't break the law because as soon as she touched him, she was ceremonially clean. Praise the Lord. That's fantastic, right? But, but why did Jesus choose love instead of the law? It's because Jesus knew that the law is love, is love. As we come closer to the end of our lives, I'm going to let you know a secret, okay? It's not that big of a secret. But the rewards in heaven are all going to be based on the law of love. Honestly true. If I can just treat you the way that God sees you today, just a little bit, there's going to be a reward for me. Why? Be it's not just because I'm doing something good. It's because I'm living in reality. I'm living according to the truth. 
And, and so as I move in this, that I'm instantly, I think, rewarded, but also this is what everything is based on. Jesus acted in this way, not to just poke his finger in the eyes of the Pharisees and any religious person who might be here today, but he's doing this because he is actually always fulfilling the law. Remember what Matthew 22, uh, what Jesus says there. He says that when you keep the law of love, you fulfill everything else that's written in the law of Moses and that the prophets spoke of. So, it's the organizational principle of his life. So I'm going to go on what seems like a tangent, but it's not, okay? I'm not being random here, all right? Um, that we have hurdles religiously that we need to get over sometimes in order for, to fulfill the law of love. There are things that happen, or more exact, there are people that can come into our lives that we know that there's a line, and we don't exactly know how to deal with this person, with their situation, with what they're going through. But if we can say, God, you know the way, and open our mind and open our ears and, and, and really seek to love first, it's not that we're going to discount any part of the truth of God's word, but we move and we're pressing and we're searching how to love first, then we're going to be able to address some of the most difficult things and the most difficult people that were around. Amen? Okay, listen. I'm going to show you a little video. You know that I'm a testimony junkie. I'm not, I'm not going to get off of this. I love it, okay? I'm a testimony junkie. And I'm going to show you a video of a young woman who came from a trans uh, background. She was uh, living as a trans man for two years, and she had been taking hormones for that entire time as well. And her pastor actually baptized her you know, as a trans man, because he legitimately believed that she uh, had found salvation in Jesus Christ. But now we're going to watch what happened just a couple of weeks after. So if we could roll that video. Hey. So a lot of you guys knew me as James, James Harley. Uh, when I came to this church, when I first started coming here, um, I was James. I was female to male transgender for two years. Um, I was on hormones. I'm not going to go into like the whole, my whole testimony, my whole story, because it's a really long one for <laughs> another time. But I was on hormones for two years. Um, I was really lost. I was depressed. I had anxiety. I was on pills. I was doing anything and anything that I could to to cope with everything that I'd been through. You know, drugs, alcohol. You name it, I was doing it. And I struggled a lot with my identity from five years old, you know? And when I found this ministry, I learned a lot about who God really was and the truth about Jesus. And last week it came to me that God's truth is so much better than anything that I was ever trying to use to heal myself. just waiting for God to speak to me and he just he hits me in a, in a deep place that I I didn't deal with you know I just sort of pushed it underneath and left it there for a while and this sermon came on my phone and it really encouraged me to dig deeper into the reason why I had become the way that I was and it was a really dark place that I didn't allow myself to think about. And when I started praying and I got into that deep place, I just broke down crying. And God said, no matter what you did, I loved you anyways. He never, he never took his blessings from me. He never punished me. You know, I was living as a, as a man and I was born a woman. And he still blessed me every day. He took care of me. Come he on. provided for me. And I just want to tell you, whatever it is that you're struggling with or going through, he doesn't care. He loves you. He knows you better than you know yourself. Yes. And I came to church a couple days, was it? Tuesday. Uh, Tuesday. We had service and we were talking about the Jezebel spirit, but I'm not going to say about it. And, uh, you know, I knew that he knew what I knew and he knew what I knew. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, after the service ended, I talked to Daniel and I talked to these amazing people here who just shepherded me and guided me. And, I said, I'm ready to be free from this thing that's stolen my identity. I'm ready to be who I am. Hallelujah. 
because God created me for a reason, and I'm tired of looking at my body and thinking that it was a mistake. I'm tired of walking around with my head down and hating myself. Because God loves you no matter what. He loves you no matter what. And he's going to tell you that. And God took all of that away from me. He er, took that from me, all that pain, all that darkness. He gave me my identity that the enemy stole. And I looked at it. Yes. When I realized that, I was like, the audacity. How dare you come for my identity, the thing that God's given me. That's a tug of war for my soul that you ain't going to win, homie. <laughs> so, I, I, I'm free. And, um, you know, everyone take your time. You know, you don't have to rush it. But I do. Yes. Because there's, a, there's an assignment that I have to do. Come on. If I'm uncomfortable in these clothes, if I'm uncomfortable in, in this, this, pro, this process, I still have to go. I'm not going to slow down. There's people who need me. There's people who need to hear what I got to say from God. I got to keep pushing, you know? So my name is Ariana Armour. That's Woo! <laughs> So I'm going to say that name again. Ariana Armour. Uh, you should look up what she's doing now, and uh, basically, I'm just so grateful. There are so many amazing things that God is doing. I I'm just going to go on this tangent just a little bit longer. One of my hobbies is to go on YouTube, type in Christian testimonies, go up to the little filters and say, today, and then I'll watch a fresh testimony that someone put up there about what Jesus did in their life. And I'm like, yes, all right, Lord, this is amazing. <laughs> so, all right. I just needed to share that. Now, listen, it's not that certain things aren't wrong. It, 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 you know, this is a young believer. Uh, when she was giving this testimony, she, she didn't mean that God is all right with everything that we do. It's that he loves us through everything that we do. He's there for us. Remember what Jesus talked to us about his father? He said he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. That's his heart all the time. And when we get into the religious mindset, we become overly concerned with what is right. Not that it's not important to be concerned. According to the law of Moses, this woman shouldn't have touched Jesus. That's a concern. But when our religious concern becomes overreaching, it can cover his love. That concern can cover his love. And then it breaks the law. It breaks the law that it was intended to fulfill, the religious spirit, okay? Okay. So, so much of life is getting the right things in the right order, okay? And Jesus, the reason he lived his life according to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself is because that is true. That is the right order to live. And he is inviting us into that. Why? First of all, because it's going to allow us to do life without undue anxiety, you're going to have anxiety. You're going to have concerns. But you can live life without a lot of undue anxiety. And, and, and what I've realized is that God wants this for me, and he wants this for you. Also, when we look at you know, where Jesus is going to take us, he will take us into situations, in, into places, for some of us, into countries that are going through a lot of different struggles. But he has brought us there so that our voice can be heard. Our identity can actually be Lift it up that we can find out who we really are. Jesus said, again, if you give your life for me and the gospel, I understand this is not evangelical Christianity anymore. The church is, is now the quote-unquote people of God exist to be entertained by entertaining good-looking Polish pastors. Okay? All right? But that's not what Jesus wants. He wants you to give your life for him and the good news of God. He wants you to be like your father who is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. He's big enough to handle it all. And if you go with him, you'll be along with, for the ride, but you'll find out that he will use you in, in those situations in, in the same way. Now, look at what Jesus said to this woman at the reason why she was healed. Because Jesus responds and tells why she was healed. Verse 48, Jesus said, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Again, the typical understanding of what this means is that this woman had sort of this high level of confidence, and she came to Jesus, and because of her confidence, because of the, the amount of faith that she had, she had level 35 faith, and if she had had 34, she wouldn't have gotten healed, okay? But because she had this high level of faith, God rewarded her for the faith. 
And I want to tell you, not true. Not one bit true. Totally against the teachings of Jesus Christ. Jesus says, if you have a mustard seed of faith, God will respond to you. And it's because, after all this time, the church still doesn't understand what faith is, is the reason why we're missing so much of Jesus. All right? Faith is not amount of force that you have, or confidence, or some sort of heavenly currency. Look, look I got $32,000 of faith. It's none of those things whatsoever. Faith, the original word, episteme, means knowledge. That's what faith means. It means knowledge. In my opinion, it means knowledge that you put into action by stepping out. She had knowledge that Messiah had healing in his wings. And she stepped out and touched the wings of his garment. I want you to understand, I believe that, that she was trembling with fear before Jesus called her out. Her confidence probably was fluctuating all over the place as she approached Jesus Christ and going through that crowd, touching all those people, making them ceremonially unclean, okay? But she went anyhow because she had episteme, faith, knowledge of who she is. Now, now, knowledge of God not acted on is not faith, okay? That's what James says. Even the devil knows there's a God. <laughs> he just can't access anything <laughs> because he's against everything that God is against. You and I are supposed to be people of faith, people who have knowledge of God. How much do you have? Well, you might have more than me in certain areas, and I might have more than you in other areas. But it only matters as we start to walk it out. In other words, follow Jesus, even if he's walking into an impossible situation. I know we've kind of gotten away from the story, but do you remember where he's going? To a sick bed, right? Now, um, so, oh boy, that was just really good. Yay, okay. So, um, so much of what we call faith is invalid because it's only faith in our faith, not in God. Okay? That's what it is. We're telling ourselves, I really believe, I really believe, I really believe. And, and, and all God is saying is, hey, if you believe, come with me, follow me, love me. And, and every single time you do that, it's not that you are pleasing to God, but you're living in his pleasure in a greater degree. Okay? That's what it means. And, and, and so don't make that mistake of falling into this trap, of feeling like if you aren't confident, you can't activate your faith. Okay, it has nothing to do with that. In fact, some of the times when my knees have knocked together the most is when I've seen God do the impossible things. It's true. Come on, do I have a witness in the room? You guys still there? Okay, absolutely true. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, this is pushing all the boundaries here. You guys okay? I'm going to sound different than all the popular preachers right now. And because I've made a decision, I'd rather be right than popular. Okay? <laughs> So I'm going to sound different than all the popular pe the preachers. And I'm going to ask this question. What if this woman wasn't healed when she touched his garment? What would that mean? Many would say something is wrong with her faith. Others would say something is wrong with God. He's not being good or loving. So that's kind of the two options that many people go towards. Something's wrong with her faith or something's wrong with God. But I'm going to try and tell you the truth, straight from Scripture. Job 1, 21. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In other words, the Lord gives. He's good. He's kind. He's generous. He's loving. He's doing something perfect. The Lord takes away. He's good. He's kind. He's generous. He's thinking of you. Blessed be his name. Okay? That's the truth. See, we say, God, we see your glory when we see signs and wonders and healings and miracles. And I, I love that. And that's from God. But in order to walk with Jesus into the impossible, we have to walk with him, letting him be Lord. Letting him decide the outcome of various things. And if we're not settled on letting him decide, then we're going to be unsettled when our will is frustrated by his will. I want you to understand something. 
that most don't reach for the impossible because they are confident, conscious of their low level of confidence in him. And, and if you can walk out with him into the next assignments that he's going to give you, your understanding of him is going to grow. Your confidence in yourself is not necessarily going to grow, but you're going to begin to see that God is good at all times. And when you, huh, let me just put it this way. Have you ever labored in prayer and just asked God for the same thing over and over? Come on, anybody here do, ever do that? You're praying for something, you're praying for someone over and over and over again. And it is so fantastic when you've tarried for a long time to see God give that answer and that breakthrough. Do I have a witness in the room today? But there is also knowledge of God and of his goodness when you pray and you pray and you pray and God doesn't do something, but then you still get to see how he's good in the situation or how he brought good out of the situation. Uh, some of the heroes in my life are people who have experienced loss and have come out shining in glory. Uh, I, I know I'm never going to make it to the big pulpits. I, I've, I've reconciled my fate to myself, okay? Okay. But this is the truth. The Lord gives, the Lord takes. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So instead of going in there feeling like I have to have a certain confidence level or I have already determined what's going to happen in the situation when I'm following Jesus into the impossible, nope, I'm like one of his disciples. I'm along for the ride. <laughs> they had no idea what was going to happen. You know, and I bet you all they were thinking about was, man, there's a lot of people pushing on us right now. But, but, and I love this. Did you recognize that even in this case, because Jesus is fully human here, that even he didn't know exactly what was happening? <gasps> the Holy Spirit did. The Father did because the power to heal this woman was released. But even Jesus didn't know who had touched him. So even Jesus here was along for the ride. He's setting my, an example for me. That's good to know. But, but the, as I'm free to follow him, then I'm going to be free to experience what he is doing, what he's do, what he's, what's happening. Um, you know, I was telling a friend of mine a little while ago about praying for a man in front of Walmart. And I, I approached this guy, and he was walking a little funny, but I didn't think there was much wrong with him. But he just said he had terrible pain in his lower legs and his feet. And so we prayed for him. And um, after the prayer, I asked him, how is he doing? And he started stamping his feet. And I always love how people basically cuss because somehow it's holy in that moment, you know, <laughs> when they're shocked by what God is doing. But he started cussing a bit and stomping his feet. And then he was just so excited. And I was telling my friend this story, and he asked me this question. Well, what do you do when someone doesn't get healed? And the interesting thing is, I said, you know what? If that happened, I'd probably, I'm just being honest with you, go, yeah, that's kind of what I expected. What I'm surprised by is how many times God will meet people on the street and not just in the house. That's what shocks me even more. So when you find yourself in one of these situations, let Jesus shock you. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. All right, let's start in verse 49. We're almost finished. While Jesus was still speaking, Someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, do not be afraid, just believe, and she will be healed. And when he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go um, with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's mother and father. Most teachers, I won't say that, many teachers will tell you that the reason why only the select group was allowed into the room is because they had the high level of faith. I'm going to tell you, I do not believe that is true. In fact, I'm going to tell you uh, the reason, according to this passage, is because these are the people who are going to be able to keep their mouths shut. <laughs> right? You don't tell a secret to everyone, do you? Come on. <laughs> All right? And, and what Jesus is doing here, he wants to keep secret. And we go, why would he do that? The reason is it's not yet time for him to go to the cross and die. And if, when he raised Lazarus from the dead, it got out, everybody knew. And the people basically said, you are our Messiah. And Jesus went willingly, but he was marched with a great group of people to Jerusalem to be declared king, to be declared the one, the savior, okay? And it's not time. So very often Jesus will do a miracle and he'll tell the people not to tell anyone. 
And very often, just like you and me, we don't listen to Jesus. <laughs> and they went and did it anyhow. <laughs> All right. Um, don't be afraid. Just believe she will be healed. And when he arrived at the house of Jarius, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, James, and the child's mother and father. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She's not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him, knowing she was dead. So the question is, is she really dead or was she in a coma? And I would say that I believe that these people knew what dead was. They, they knew what heartbeats were. They knew what breathing was. And so they could probably tell the difference between a coma and death. And so I believe that uh, she's dead. They laughed at him, knowing she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. And her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them, Give her something to eat. And her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. Jesus didn't visit every sickbed. He didn't interrupt every funeral. But he knows something that we often forget, and that is that every human being is immortal. They're going to live forever. Um, and this little girl, though he raised her from the dead, she was going to die again one day. Have you had that deep thought? It's a deep one, right? She's going to die again one day. But Jesus knew that when she died, that God was going to be good. He was going to be good, and he was going to keep her. So I hope I can say this right. But it's according to the law of love that God heals. And it's according to the law of love that God takes. And his priorities are always straight. And when he takes, especially if it's from me or from around me, it does require a sacrifice of praise from me in order to say, the Lord gives, the Lord takes. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He's good all the time. I'm going to finish with just a couple of things. I'm going to invite my friend Jose to come up. Would you come up here? <laughs> because uh, I'm going to ask you to tell the story of one of the 75 times, a story of uh, one of your 75 stories of when you almost died. And I'm going <laughs> to, this is not a joke, is it? <laughs> so uh, could you talk about what happened to you when you woke up in the morning and you were eating your cereal and then you had a heart incident? Yeah, well, um, first I was born with a heart condition, so I would get these arrhythmias, and, um, which would lead to congestive heart failure, which would lead to actually fluids building up in my lungs and ending up in the hospital. And this one moment, um, it was so bad that when I got to the hospital, well, actually when they picked me up, usually I would know what's going on. I'm aware of what's happening. And I get to the hospital and I see them working on me. This one time, <clears throat> I was out. And it wasn't until about a day and a half or so I woke up and they told me that they, they told my wife, they told the pastor that, that I wasn't going to make it. And, uh, well, and, and you had actually <clears throat> basically sucked in stomach contents into your lungs. Well, yeah, that's because I had eaten, and with the congestive heart failure, it, everything came back up, and some went inside my lungs and started damaging my lungs, and, and just I couldn't breathe. I could not breathe, and, and I just blacked out, and that was it. That's all I remember. And so there was, when I got there and went back into the emergency room, there was something that they had used to suck out all the contents mm -hmm. that were in his lungs, and it was terrible. Yeah. It was terrible. And the doctor had just left after telling his wife that his lungs were burned and he's not going to make it through the night. So our yeah. faith level went real yeah. high, okay? Yeah. <laughs> I'm saying faith in our faith, okay? Yeah. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll pick it up if you don't mind just a little bit. Well, I just want to add something. So uh, as he's talking about faith, and I'm, I'm listening to this, that um, throughout all this ordeal up until the transplant and whatnot, my faith wasn't in the doctors and the medications Amen. and all that. It, it was all in God because I knew those were part of his plan. He put the doctors, the transplant team together and caused me because there's 3,000 people that only get transplants a year. And there's 20 some thousand plus people that are waiting on a list. Mm -hmm. So I was blessed to be one of those to get one. And so through all of that, you know, it was all God. It wasn't me, and it was Amen. my faith in him. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. 
So just to pick up the story from, from where it was, um, I'm standing in the emergency room. His wife, who's usually together, was completely coming undone, just weeping, and I'm weeping. And we're scared. If you want to ask, you know, what, what was your confidence at? It was that terrified. It was that scared. And I just tried to listen. If you don't know what to do, try and listen to God. <laughs> I tried to listen. God, what are you doing? What are you saying? What do you want? And the weirdest thing popped in my head, and it was to ask his wife about their vacation plans, their next vacation plans, which they didn't have any. Shame on you, okay? <laughs> so I said, wait a minute. Where are you? You know, I, I said, this seems ridiculous. This seems silly. But I had her talk about where she would like to go with Jose. And as we talked a little more and talked a little more, I said, I think we're supposed to pray that you guys are able to do that, that you're able, that he's able to get out of the hospital. And so we prayed, and, and we prayed hard. And um, the next day when I got to the hospital, I went up to your room, and the doctor was listening and working on his, his heart, and he just looked at me and said, hi, Pastor Allen, and it nearly floored me. I didn't know if I was going to find my friend there at all, but God is good. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen? All right. One, one more story, because I hope that, that I can really define the boundaries of this message of what it means to follow Jesus into the impossible and what it means to deal with the reality of God and the reality of the world at the exact same time. That when we face someone with deep identity issues, with crazy addictions, with real hurt going on, that we understand it's over us, but it's never over him. But, and and we, we follow this law of love. And go ahead and allow it to attract us to someone else, even if they're in a hurting place. I have a friend named Juan, not the one that's here today, but another Juan. And when I met Juan, Juan had uh, liver cancer. And I remember immediately saying, I want to pray for you for your liver cancer. And so we prayed. And it was really great. He got the blood work back. I can't remember if it was a week or two. And he was declared cancer-free. And we were celebrated. Yay, Lord, this is fantastic. And we just became good friends. We'd go out and, and grab breakfast um, sometimes. Well, it was a couple years later. And he, again, he got a different type of cancer. And so we prayed and we prayed. And it took a while. And he went through all sorts of treatments at that particular time. And what ended up happening was he was declared uh, to be in remission again. And it was like, whew, thank God, thank you, Lord. And then about a year later, he got cancer again. And this time he went down fast. And he wasn't coming to church anymore. I, I'm, I don't mean to point at this section in any weird way, but, but I can still see him sometimes over there because he would sit right over there. And I remember I would go and visit him sometimes during the week, but I'd try and go over to his house real close on Sunday after church. And at one point, I took both my daughters. They were very little then. But I wanted them to see what death was and what a man of faith was, someone who knew something about God and was living in it, was active in it. And I remember Juan looking at my girls and saying, I want to tell you something. Dying with Jesus is easy. One of the most meaningful things that has ever been spoken to my girls and to me. And then he said, but cancer's hard. And Juan passed away. His funeral was wild. It's the only funeral where I had to break up a family fight. <laughs> <laughs> but I preached the gospel. People opened their hearts to the Lord. There was a big picture of one that was right on one side with him smiling. I know that God is good and is holding my friend Juan in his good keeping. Don't be afraid. You're made to walk with him. Don't be annoyed when someone else has a difficulty. Just Make sure Jesus is in front. <laughs> and if you're in front, just slip behind him again. Say, I want to pray for you. I want to tell you something Jesus said. Just push him right out in front. And I believe that you'll be able to go with him into the impossible. Amen? Amen. Would you please stand?